exhibition for the Art Gallery of Northumberland uh, in, in my home. Uh, gratefully, our artist, uh, Bob Omar Tunick, has uh, agreed to come and visit and appreciate a little bit of uh, physical distancing here in, in, my, in my space. Um, this is the first interview of hopefully what will be a long series uh, of an ongoing series uh, depicting uh, interviewing artists of, of the area of Northumberland County uh, and maybe a little bit beyond. Um, and it, it will be broadcast through the auspices of the Art Gallery of Northumberland. Bob Omar Tunick. Yes, to meet you. <laughs> Welcome, and to the, you know, you're the very first, so no, we really you appreciate much. you coming here. Oh, um, I'm flattered, thank you. So, you have a very interesting history. It's not the normal trajectory for a painter. Uh, you started in, in, you started training as a painter in, in art school, yeah. correct? Yeah. Uh, at uh, which college was I it? I went to Humber College Fine Arts Program, and then I went to, uh, I think it's, it's called the Emily Carr School of Art. No, but back then it was the Vancouver School of Art. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I was there for a year, I think, in that one. Yeah. Well, that's a very well-known school. They both are. Um, and then you're, you're, you had a really interesting uh, initial experience with a very famous art, coll uh, art collector, gallerist. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that story? Uh, do you mean that one? Yeah. Um, well, well, back, was that in the 80s? I, I can't even remember. It had been the late 70s. Um, you know, went out there to try and, you know, get out there in the art world and stuff. So <clears throat> I went to a few different galleries, actually. And uh, I had, um, oh, I was at the Outdoor Art Exhibition. And this fellow came up to me. His name was Morden Yalis. And he came up and said, listen, here's my card. Uh, why don't you go see Avram and uh, tell him I sent you and la -di -da, da So and I don't know how many phone calls I made, finally. I got a, an appointment set up, and this was when the gallery was on John Street. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got an appointment, and I went and uh, went into the gallery, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, um, um, uh, so uh, where's your work? And I said, well, it's in the car. I'll go get it. She says, no, no, I'll just go to the car and look at it. So I go, oh, okay, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> and so he comes to the car, and he looks, and he goes, uh, ooh, yeah, this is, a, this is interesting. Uh, where do you live? I said, well, I live up at Bayview and Shepherd in an apartment. He goes, oh, not interested. And all I could figure out from that was I didn't have a studio on Queen Street right. or I wasn't, you know. And so uh, so that was some of the initial right. uh, things I had. And there was another gallery at 80 Spadina where it, uh, I can't remember the name, but it was a well-known one. And I took, uh, you, that's when you could drop your portfolio off, you know, and then they'd look and say, call back two weeks later. So I called back two weeks later and they said, uh, oh yeah, sorry, it's just not quite what we're looking for, but uh, you can come down and pick your portfolio. So I went to pick it up and it was exactly in the same place where she had put it with dust on it. Oh dear. So they <laughs> never been like opened yeah. it. So, so the pessimism starts to enter the art yeah. world, right? And uh, at that, that particular time, there was an organization called Visual Arts Ontario, mm -hmm. and they had all these little workshops, you know, and there was a, a workshop about the, the art industry and, uh, What's the matter with it, or you know, what blah da 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 da, da. and uh, so I went to one of these things, and it was real interesting. They sent out, I'm going to call them a secret agent, to go to the different galleries, you know, just to get a feel and to get some kind of response that he could tell people. And and it was interesting because he said, yeah, he said I felt very unwelcome in a lot of these galleries. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't really worthy of being there. They kind of uh, made me feel un unworthy to be there, right? And there was a sense of uh, condescendingness about mm -hmm. them. And so it was a very interesting meeting, you know, because uh, like the general public is afraid to go in the gallery anyways because they feel they don't know anything, mm -hmm. right? And so it should be accepting to everybody. And, you know, you should be bringing the people yeah. in and talking to them, you know, when they come in. Well, hopefully the times have changed Yeah, that's, that's over um, 40 years ago. I, think. I, I remember I a mean, similar, you know, uh, situation with, art, with um, uh, architecture school, I recall, you know, the, the kind of intimidation that... Mm -hmm. Um, the students felt, rather than elevated and kind yeah. of made to feel worthy, which yeah. is what we try to do now, yeah. uh, and in, instill confidence. Uh, there, back then, I think yeah. in the 70s, 80s, and yeah. knows, before that, we weren't around, yeah. um, there was always a kind of a, a toughness to, you know, you need to be able to take this, yeah. uh, and, you know, just to 
prove your worth. But, yeah. So th- th- those two initial stories that are that were heard, and and for you seminal to your evolution because then from that you you also were a musician. Yeah. And you ended up in, working professionally as a musician yeah. and did uh, have you know to the extent where you have won. Awards, uh, right. Junos, and accolades. Uh, tell us a little bit how did both of those practices, which both each require a tremendous amount of commitment and discipline, right. did they happen concurrently or did one happen before the other? Well, I was always drawing and painting as a, as a kid, mm-hmm. and I was playing music when I was like 15, 16, you know, and um, yeah, they just kind of worked hand in hand. Um, it's a blessed curse this creative bug. So the good thing is I can, sometimes you can't look at a painting, you know, you just, that's it, I can't look at this painting anymore, and you leave it alone, so I'll go and start playing guitar, writing a song. So I can kind of bounce them off each other, you know? So, um, they, they, they always did work hand in hand. Even when I was on the road, I would take something to do, you know, uh, uh, in the hotel room. So, you know, some kind of art thing. So I was always, uh, yeah, just, you know. So does that, even today, does that sort of describe how you work today? You bounce around uh, writing, you continue yeah. to write music, yeah. and I've, I've, I've heard right. a few things that you sent me, and oh, it's just right. incredible, uh, oh, no. very Thank rich, very <laughs> like not, you know, you know, you can tell that you've put in your... Your time, no, in the bars, in, in the prison, <laughs> yeah. um, of of creativity yeah. and like the, the very rich. Um, so when you do in your practice, in your in your process, do you spend one day doing one thing and then another day doing the next, or do you uh, within the same day do you kind of just go back and forth? Yeah, sir. I have no control on how I think. It's ridiculous, and, and you know, my wife will say. Why don't you get, like get a little you know time plan schedule or whatever and, and do that, and uh, I just can't do it. <laughs> I, no, like I'll start painting. Sometimes you know I, I took a course in meditation for a while, uh, and um, uh, it was a Buddhist uh, Korean Buddhist thing, and and I just wanted to take meditation. You know, right? and uh, but they were teaching the, the practice of Buddhism, which is fine, and uh, I, I asked the head instructor. Uh, this monk, and uh, I said, can you just take meditation without doing all this other stuff, right? And uh, uh, so 20 minutes later, I had no idea what he was talking about, right? It was Zoom. So the next class I went to, I asked one of his disciples who was teaching, he says, yes, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to take the scriptures and all that stuff, just meditate. And as I got into it more, I realized that, um, like, time disappears when you're painting right. or playing music, right? And it's, I looked a little more, and it's a form of meditation, to be, you know, where time just disappears and you're so involved in the moment. So sometimes I'll paint and all of a sudden eight hours has gone by and I'm like, holy crap, what happened? Where'd that go? And music is a whole thing too. You're in another yeah, world. Zone. Like, yeah. Is that kind of like what we say when we say we're in, a zo- in the in, zone? In the zone, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, I think a lot of people can get that, appreciate that. Yeah. Even people maybe who get into the zone by running or well, yeah, so it, it, or, there's a, it doesn't have to be the so arts. Is it a repetitive, do you think, process? Like the, the act of, you know, playing a song and perfecting a song, you practice it over yeah. and over again. So you, you listen to it yeah. a lot more than other people will be listening to it. And then and similarly with your painting, especially your painting, because it's extremely uh, delicate. And, and I'm looking at some pictures here. Uh, very uh, rich and detailed and illusory. Mm-hmm. There is very much uh, a sense of creating a world that has so much detail in it and so much uh, richness. You could you could reach into the painting almost right. and feel like you could grab grab or, or hold on to one of these right. still life objects, yeah. uh, whether it's a glass or a frog yeah. or a candelabra, right. um, or touch the wall behind these objects and feel the velvet right. as if it's actual velvet. The paintings are that rich, um, mm-hmm. which to my mind requires a lot of patience. Mm-hmm. Um, but does this sort of methodical, meditative, repetitive brushwork approach, which is clearly right. in your paintings, have a meditative uh, quality, quality to it? Like, do you yeah. feel like you're you're, that's, you know, the, the kind of painting that you do yeah. is highly meditative. You're not, uh, you're not 
doing it quickly, you're doing it very slowly. Yeah, it's a, a process, steps, like, you know, I'll, uh, I'll sketch the whole thing in, and then it's just layers of color and, and, and shading and stuff, and then as you do it more, you start seeing more, and as you look more at the photograph that you're working from, like you'll have certain, you go, oh, oh, you notice stuff you never noticed before. Like when I painted the glasses in that frog painting that you're looking at now, I had never painted glass before, right? And I that said, was the first time. That was the first time I said, okay, so then I, and I actually got this kind of magnifying, uh, you know, glass, big thing, and started looking at the photo, and there's like a kind of dragon of the photo. I said, my God, look at all the different tonal values and shapes and stuff. And uh, yeah, you, you just get lost in it, right? And then, well, you know, it's like, then you never know when to finish it, yeah. when it's finished or not, right? Yeah. It's because you can just kill yourself trying to finish it. You're really interested the way you describe that, especially in the microcosm of things, yeah. that, you know, the, the very inward life of things, how they uh, are, are, like the reality of these objects that have um, material and meaning onto themselves, yeah. you know, they exist onto themselves. A lot of, you know, and I noticed there is, you do a few different series, but in this particular series that we're talking about, the painting called Undercover. Right. Uh, Amazon Horn Frog. Yeah. Uh, I mean that the title alone, you know, begs, you know, ten or twenty questions. Okay. Um, so you know, who is this Amazon Horn Frog, and why does he appear in your still life paintings? Okay, so uh, you can see the frog, right? The Amazon Horn Frog. So they're they're ambush predators. So they just sit in the forest litter and just wait for something to come by. And then they eat it, right? And they have a mouth that goes halfway around their face. And they eat mice, they eat everything, right? So um, I decided that in this particular painting, I would put him amongst a bunch of ceramic frogs. He's undercover in a different sense, right? So he's uh, trying to hide among these ceramic frogs and it doesn't quite work. In somebody's dining room. Yeah, that's our yeah. dining room, actually. So like your dining room. Yeah. And so he, he, he arrives from the Amazon uh, to Northumberland County, where you live, <laughs> sure. in your, in your uh, dining room, room, and I know you paint in, in your dining room yeah. as well, right? So here's a painting of this creature that that is, uh, you know, not not pretty, mm -hmm. but depend maybe to another frog, he's, to the eyes he's very the pretty, yeah. yeah. But uh, in your beautiful cabinet here, you know, this rich red, uh, to me it looks like mahogany right. um, cabinet with these delicate glass pieces uh, uh, camouflaged with his ceramic buddies right. in your dining room which is a place for eating yeah. so you know is, is the eating wife, part important don't, don't let my wife know that oh dear <laughs> <laughs> well I assume you didn't actually go to the Amazon and pick up one no, of no, I said, no I've always been interested in the reptiles and amphibians it's been a, a kind of love of mine so I'm always, I think what I'm trying to do in my painting is kind of educate the public about what's out there. Because a lot of times people go, how did you think of that? And I said, well, I didn't think of it. It actually exists. Mm -hmm. And then the, the conversation starts, the dialogue, dialogue starts with the person. And then I try to explain kind of the life history and, the, and then they go, oh my God. And hopefully it sparks interest in them to go and, and do more, you know, uh, uh, seek more knowledge about these things themselves. themselves. Yeah. Because the, the natural world is gone now, you know, like technology is, people aren't interested a lot. Of right. It, you know? Or it's, it's morphed, um, you know, like when the paintings are so unusual and mm -hmm. weird, the animals look so weird. Yeah. You, you mentioned just now that people think that you've created yeah, these yeah, animals, yeah, that they're, they're not actually real. Yeah, they're a fabric or one Right, and which is super interesting because we are, that just proves your point, yeah. that we are so uh, divorced from... Yeah, or separate from the natural world. Yeah, and there's so many fat and and in the big picture, everything's related. Like it, it, something exists because something else exists. Because that, and it's it's a very complex interwoven system. Mm -hmm. And as you start taking things out of that system, things start to collapse. Yeah. And so you know, I, I want kind of people to understand that, right? And so by painting these, and then plus a lot of things I paint, they're, they're endangered. You know that kind of stuff, right? And uh, you know, in our generation, our our children, our grandkids will never see any of these things, you know? mm. and it's happening at a terrible rate. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned ecosystem and and you know the the food chain, I suppose, yeah. frogs, etc. And that must be very complex and mm. delicate. Yeah, uh, and and here you are doing something that I, that I think is rather timely as well, because a lot of artists are interested in 
in um, looking at nature, looking at landscape um, in, a, in, in a contemporary way, which doesn't mean, of course, if we want to say that looking at it in the 19th century, one painted these landscapes as if, you know, uh, they're set up as perspectives whereby we own the landscape yeah. or it's depicted in a way to show and our romantic, wealth, yeah, romantic, romantic yeah. or a lot of projection yeah. of our own psyches yeah. on the landscape. Yeah. Um, I suppose that still exists today. We are projecting on the landscape. We have yeah. no choice, but to, to we're always separate yeah. regardless. In fact, one might even say that nature didn't exist until we started developing art and stories yeah. and separated ourselves from nature. Before yeah. that, nature was just there, there, yeah. and we were there yeah. as well. So um, for me, I th this series almost... It really ties into what a lot of other artists are doing, but in a completely unique way. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so exciting about it. Your vision um, is, has, it's taken years yeah. to develop, and we're, we were just kind of touching on your history yeah. in music, the but 60s, not really getting yeah. into it. The 60s were good. 60s. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, the, the philosophies and, and kind of environmentalism oh, of the 60s? No. The, what, the, what aspect of the 60s? The intoxicants. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they stimulated yeah. you, yeah? You know? no, 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 just that. Uh, just, I'm just being I was joking. I'm yeah. just being goofy. And, you but, know. you know, but are we? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, I mean, the, I suppose, you, you know, the, you know, the, these frogs, do they, they probably produce some sort of venom that intoxicates their prey, and then they, well, they consume a, them. So there is this sort of... There's another one there, uh, of a frog, and he's under the halogen. Can I find it for you? Yeah, for, for sure. What's special about this frog? Oh, oh, um, i got to find the blade in here. This one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's called Phylomedusa bicolor. It's called the giant waxy monkey tree frog. And uh, it's in the Amazon. And the natives go in the forest and they look for them and they put four little stakes in the ground and they tie their limbs to these stakes and they put a smoking ember under them. And the ember uh, makes them produce this toxin from their skin. And the women of the tribe come and they s scrape the toxin off right. and then they let the frog go and then they, uh, they heat up a stick, a pointed stick, and they stab the men in the arm and it causes a, a, a blister, like a, you know, a heat blister. They scrape the blister off and they rub that stuff in the wound. Right. And then about 15, 20 minutes later, they become violently ill. They throw up, they have diarrhea, and then they start talking, you know, in tongues and They're stuff. They're hallucinating. Like, They're hallucinating. Yeah. And they go, okay, down the river, eight, eight miles is two sloths in the tree. Off they go, and sure enough, down the river, up in a tree, wasn't two, but there was one. They use it for hunting, like for giving visions. Wow. And uh, they studied this stuff. Uh, there's a guy, Dante Farinello, who took this, you know, took some of this stuff back to Los Angeles and decided to try it himself. And he says he was high for a week. You know, he said it was wild. Mm -hmm. But uh, all these things, uh, there's poison arrow frogs, the little tiny ones, you know? Right. And, uh, so these little creatures, um, this is really fascinating. They have a lot of agency. They have yeah, yeah, <laughs> chemicals yeah. in them that, yeah. that can do certain things, and and certain peoples have discovered these properties. Um, like it amazes me that how the heck did they find that? Like you know, figured out. Yeah, figured yeah. out. Like how the heck did they figure that? How did that ever? And happen? then develop a whole kind of yeah. science around it. If you yeah. Will. yeah, it's like there's other frogs here. Uh, what are called uh, poison arrow frogs. I gotta find them. I don't know if they're even on the site yet. You also do a lot of birds. Yeah, I was, well, I just and insects. Like, yeah, is there any poison arrow frogs in this one? There yeah, are. There's some. Yeah. So these things. This one's called slime mold and poison arrow frogs on a bed of parsley. Yeah, I did a series called uh, uh, hors d'oeuvres. Uh, what they call? I can't remember. It's called eccentric hors d'oeuvres or whatever. And it's just I tried to combine nature with. You know, food. Have you ever thought about opening a restaurant? <laughs> I don't think anybody would come. Maybe one visit only. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I see your point. Yeah. <laughs> but, but these things, for instance, they're really small, right? They're t and their colors are incredibly vibrant because they're warnings for predators, right? Predators won't go near them because of the colors. But um, their life cycle is wild. Are you sure where the bromeliad is? Yeah. 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 So in the, in the tropics, the bromeliads go in the cracks of trees and stuff like this. So they'll call each other and mate. And then uh, the female will go up 
and laid 10 eggs in one of those little bracts, mm. you know, that collects water, so it'd be this big. So she lays the eggs in there, and then 10 days later, the male comes back, crawls in the bract, and all the tadpoles crawl on his back. And then he delivers one tadpole to each little bract of water so it has its own kind of little aquarium because they're carnivorous and they'll eat each other. The female then comes back and lays unfertilized eggs in each of the little bracts because that's their food source. You know? And uh, like I do, when I tell people, they go, huh? And, uh, but, I, uh, but that's what I find fascinating about nature. When, if you get people interested right. in it, you know, they, they hopefully will go off on their own and look into these things. You know? Does living in, in, in the rural environment is that a, a conscious decision or purely a coincidence? Like not living in the city, we yeah, lived no, in we, the city for a long time. Yeah, we did. And it, when uh, yeah, we could never afford anything in the city, anyways, and we didn't want to even live in the city, right? So um, it, it was a conscious decision, and uh, I wish we had done it twenty years ago. Mm. You know, uh, we love it up there. Mm. I just can't bring any pets in the house. Do you make This isn't good. Oh, is that because? Per, no, oh, I've put my aller allergies. No, 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 no. <laughs> I've put my my poor wife through the ring with all my weird. The reptiles, the yeah, reptiles. I see. Yeah, they've had snakes get out and the frogs. Get oh, out, you know? so they know. And the crickets would get out. The crickets. And, well, I'd feed the frogs crickets, right? right? Of course. And the geckos and the and the. <laughs> you need to live in South America. Yeah, then I wouldn't have to have a bird wandering around the streets. So we're just having a small interruption here. The UPS driver is arriving outside the door. Uh, we may need to pause and just, yes, he's bringing something for me to sign. So we'll just press pause and resume in a second. We'll be back. Welcome back from our station break. Thank you, UPS. Um, there's a little plug. Yep. He was great. He was very efficient, very friendly. Yeah, boom, boom, yeah. Gone. Yeah. I think that's really nice. It's nice to have occasional uh, social it's <laughs> experiences <so fun>. <laughs> in this time because, you know, yeah. it's exciting when somebody drops oh, by. Yeah. Thank you for coming oh, today. Thank you for having me. Um, so we were talking about crickets and, and your love of strange animals, yeah. Yeah. let's just say pets. <laughs> Uh, and you're not allowed to have them in the house anymore. Well, she's, so I put, like I said, my wife has been extremely understanding. How? Through, Go ahead. Yeah, throughout our uh, marriage. And, uh, but she said, okay, that's enough. No, I have kind of... Well, on that note, what about the music? Did, did she mind you bringing your friends over to play and jam? Or was that something no, that... No, that never happened. Never, you always went yeah, somewhere else. Yeah, because we were in an apartment, right? Yeah. And we were in a small apartment building. She was the superintendent there. So, um, yeah, there was, yeah, I couldn't have done that there. Tell me about your first band. What was that? Oh, boy. Um, Winnipeg. In Winnipeg? Yeah. That was a, a, a kind of a blues band. I don't know. We were like a young, right? 15, 16. And, um, yeah. Well, what about your first professional band? Okay, just let me think here. I moved to Toronto from Winnipeg. And... Uh, Oh, I met a friend uh, who's one of my closest friends still today, and um, someone had set us up. We moved there and we started playing, and we had a three-piece band, no vocals, and we'd go and do uh, coffee houses. Remember, there was coffee houses back then. So, it, and then we'd just be jamming at the coffee houses all night, and endless solos, solos, solos. I have met the people so hung around. So that was, I guess, you know, I can't remember who that paid. Maybe that coffee or cookies, I can't remember it. And then after that, what did I get? Uh, what did I get into? I'm trying to think here. Um, when was your breakthrough? Um, okay, so I played with the. Well, I'm just trying to think of all the people I played with and how it kind of sequestered into these different things. Um, like the, the good thing back then was there was tons of places to play. You know, you could play you could play seven nights a week, and. Uh, it was it was great because that's how you hone your craft, right? I feel bad for musicians, young musicians. They they have nowhere to play, that's true. and the interaction between musicians is really important because you get ideas, you know, and you bounce off things, you know, and and uh, it's an ecosystem, just like it is. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a sound <laughs> ecosystem, yeah. right? and um, so you just meet musicians that way. So I was in a bunch of bands. I, I was in a band called the Cameo Blues Band for quite a while, and then. Um, Oh, Grant, a whole bunch of guys. Yeah, Grant Fullerton. And the band you were with the longest? It was Fathead. Yeah. What? So when did they start? When did uh, you start with them originally? Was it in the 80s? 
Mm, or later. Yeah, maybe early 90s, early I would 90s. think, yeah. And, um, yeah. It, 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 what was, what do you think the role of the bass player in that ecosystem is? What's the responsibility of the bass player, which is your instrument? Yeah, um, well, you can't screw up. Right? <laughs> so, so um, because basically it's we're the rhythm section, and, and uh, so, uh, like, a guitar players, they can kind of... Make the wrong move? Well, they can make, move around. Yeah, right? move around, yeah. But if, if, if we go the wrong way, which I've done lots of times in the past, everything kind of goes, what's going on, right? So um, it's, like, it's about uh, uh, the rhythm section they call the engine room, right? So you're there to just uh, l listen to everybody and kind of back them up and watch where they're going and, and give them a push, you know, every once in a while yeah. to, to up the ante a bit. And, um, so you're in constant communication with the drummer? All the time, right? right. And the other the players too, but yeah. the, the drummer's, you know. Really key. Yeah. And you, your choice of, of playing fretless bass, does, yeah. so, you know, with a fretless bass, can you easily uh, Cover. correct your mistake oh, when yeah. if you're on the wrong note you, you can just go, oh, here we go yeah. here's a note yeah. so that is that that was one of the benefits of playing the fretless bass on the other hand you don't know what the heck you're playing because there are no frets there's no frets yeah. so how, do you, how did you compensate for for fret for no yeah. frets when you're in a dark bar with, well you hear it. you hear you're it. to hear it yeah so it's, and, uh, you're not really looking, you're, you're listening. Well, yeah, they, like uh, on the side of it, there's still the little dots are there. Right. So, but it become, it, it's a feel thing, yeah. and you start to hear stuff, you know, and hear it go. So um, but the, how I became fretless was uh, uh, I drank a bottle of Silent Sam Vodka, and I woke up the next morning, I had pulled all my frets out. For what reason? I don't have no, no idea. idea. <laughs> I just woke up and said, oh my God, what did I do? So I had to learn how to play fretless and I had a gig that night and that was god awful because I didn't know what was going on. Oh but they kept me in the band which was good. So that was in Vancouver yeah. actually, yeah. I mean I hope it was a punk band. No, it no, was a blues art <laughs> It sounds gig. like you know you were yeah. I could in a punk band I could have gone away with could have gone, yeah. well you could have gotten away with yeah. playing all the wrong notes. Yeah. yeah. And not have clothes on too. You know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well it's you know you're Technical acumen with the paintbrush um, is so evident, and uh, you know the the kind of these these skill sets are interchangeable to a certain degree. Like mm -hmm. if you if you practice long enough, right? So yeah. obviously you've been holding a paintbrush since for for many many years, and you've been holding the same base. You you still you play the yeah, same base. Yeah, I still have my one. original base, uh, yeah. and. Uh, but I wore the, the fretboard right off it because there's no frets, right? Mm -hmm. So the rosewood fretboard got worn right off. So I had to take it to a luthier friend of mine. Plug for Joey Anicello, unbelievable guitar maker. And uh, he put an ebony fretboard on for me. Right. But while he was doing that, he built me another base because uh, you can buy all the parts and the right? and stuff right. like that, the body and the neck. And uh, he made it the same. And uh, he measured the specs on my base and everything, you know, with a micrometer and did all that stuff and sand it and everything. And I asked him, Joe, don't put any varnish on the back of the neck because I had worn it off on the mm -hmm. old base. And, and that's hand, how you liked it. Yeah, and your yeah. hand moves around. So I got the base back and it was great. I said, Joe, is there some varnish on this neck? He said, I can't believe you felt that. He says, I went like this, so light, he said. And, uh, but it's amazing how your hand becomes sensitive to what you... Because even the, you know, when I pick up the old base, it still feels better to me. And uh, on my, the one that I played on my new bass all the time, it, it felt like it was bigger. But he showed me, he said, no, look at this. And he has like this special calibrated micrometer thing. He says, all the measures are exactly the same. And I said, wow. It's just, it, it's like I love the bass he made for me. But I still can feel a difference between the two. Well, it's really interesting to think about all the stuff that goes on behind, behind the scenes with music, like the bass, luthier, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the varnishing or yeah. the non-varnishing. Um, the kind of ecosystem, if you will, of, of music as a, an art form. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the final presentation, which is sort of the, the varnishing at the end, at, yeah. at the, at the you know, performance. Yeah. Um, you know, and the kind of, you were t talking about feeling <clears throat> the, wood, the wood of the, yeah. um, the stem of the bass and, and the same kind of touch, which is uh, so important in, in the way you uh, uh, hold the brush mm -hmm. and, and apply the brush, yeah. the different brushes. Yeah. Uh, there's so much nuance and, and subtlety to 
and it mixed in the colors. Yeah. Um, you know, I I can only imagine your process in terms of let's say first drawing, laying out, imagining, yeah. uh, using reference material yeah. for frogs. You have to know yeah. what they look like unless they're all in your brain, unless you have photographic memory. Most no, of us I use yeah. reference material. Yeah. Um, in music, we use, of course, our reference material is other recordings yep. or, or, or scores. Um, when you approach writing now, mm -hmm. uh, music, yeah. uh, which is, uh, of course, we now have the computers to, mm -hmm. to aid us with, and I know that you do uh, function quite well around the computer and, and uh, 64 six, yeah. well yeah. but I, but you use it and yeah. you adapt to yeah. it uh, so the ecosystem of the computer and music can you t tell us a little bit about your process but now you With use writing? the computer yeah in um, music how I use the computer in music yeah well um, I have a bunch of uh, I have pro tools on my computer but I have these little I just got another new little recorder because over the other one out because they make these unbelievable it's amazing what they make these days right so it has all these drum patterns built in and everything like that kind of stuff. It's never over, it'll never replace a real drummer, mm -hmm. but at least I can get the, the the format, the basic format there, and then just give it to somebody and say, you know, don't you don't have to hold to this beat or, and uh, and actually when I do give it to drummers, sometimes uh, they said don't send me the drum pattern because immediately they want to play that right. Yes. So he said just leave the count and there and, and they'll come up with something. Well, that's really interesting. So you. I mean, you use the computer as a, a, a machine, a yeah. tool to, to score, yeah. but just like a composer would, um, you know, in previous times, score manually, yeah. uh, but then the interpretation, the real drummer, the, you know, yeah. the, the people that, that contribute to the overall ecosystem of the, of the music, yeah. which is one work of art, yeah. uh, but you can see how each... Like one work of art is actually broken down into yeah. several pieces yeah. of art making yeah. contributed by different people. Um, that's a bit different, I suppose, in painting in in a solitary way in your in your studio. Yeah. Um, do you, you know, one is extremely social, right. and and the other is extremely solitary. Yeah. Um, is there any other than like moments where you talk with other artists or? Yeah. Today we're talking, or uh, you have a painting that you brought with you in the car, and you were ju just picking that up from an exhibition, yeah. um, which we'll we'll pull up on the screen uh, later in post production mm -hmm. and show everybody. Um, at, at, you know, the, at what point uh, is the is the painting finished? And I don't mean that just like when do you know the last yeah. brush stroke is finished, but it seems to me you you are very much interested. Uh, in showing people your work, you don't. You mean you do have a performance history, and and one of the you know challenge, one of the hard things I think for painters mm -hmm. maybe is is you know putting your work up on the wall, yeah. and and having it judged and yeah, all that stuff, and yeah. critiqued and, and and sometimes you know it doesn't go well. All the people yeah. may not like it, and other times people are just blown away. Um, you know, you must have a certain amount of uh, uh, experience. Developing a thick skin, you know, three yeah, years when, in a when I was younger, you know, like when I mentioned those galleries to you, that was it was profound. like, okay, yeah. is this what, this is what the art world is all about? Maybe I don't belong here, mm -hmm. right? but I, I can't stop painting. That's what I just did, you know, or what I do. So you just keep going, you know, yeah. and um, and, then, and here we are, and here we are, four now. years later, and we're still yeah. working. We're still working. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm I'm a fan. I think you know that. I, I'm well, a real you. fan of your work, and I do see it. On, you know, on so many different levels, I see it both as a personal expression of right. who you are, but also it does communicate so much. And I, I am very much interested in work that, that goes beyond the sort of internal right. process that any artist is interested in, but somehow bridges uh, and, and is about something yeah. outside of the artist, yeah. right? It's not just pure expression. I think your work, in my mind, mm -hmm. uh, does it beautifully. Um, and it, it's come about in a very intuitive way out of your own personal interest in, right. in these animals to begin yeah. with. It probably harks back to your childhood. Yeah. But, um, you know, now uh, you are showing quite a bit and I, I'm really happy to oh, see that. Um, uh, we, we have, um, I know you've shown at the Art Gallery of Northumberland before, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully again in the future. And also uh, you have a show planned here in Warkworth, yeah. uh, if all goes well with COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, next next year yeah. in 2021, cross fingers, 
uh, that we'll we'll be working on together. Yep, which I'm um, very happy about. So we're just outside of the town of the town of Warkworth mm -hmm. here, and there's a lovely uh, a public art gallery called uh, the Arts Arts and Heritage Center in Warkworth, and 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 Omar has a, a show there next year. Um, this might be a little bit hard, but what are your aspirations? What, where would you like to see your work? I mean, if we kind of let just uh, don't be modest. Where would you like your work to be seen? Uh, I, I never really thought of. No? To be honest, I never really thought about it. I'm happy to sell the pieces that I do sell. Um, uh, my whole thing is just to get it seen, you know. Which uh, so that's why I enter these jury things. And if you like years ago, if you did, if I didn't get something in, I would just go. Oh. But then now, like you said, you just get a thick skin, you know, because you you can't satisfy every. And I, I have sat on juries before, right? And. Uh, you, you can't satisfy everyone's personal taste, right? Yeah. So sometimes you see things that you go, wow, I wish I had a guy in or not. And you, plus, there's, they can only accept so many works, you know what I mean? So um, I understand the whole thing, you know? And if I don't get in, I don't get in. If I do get in, great. If I win an award, even better, but you know? Well, you I know? think your work should be hung at the National Gallery of Canada, and I think one day, hopefully, it will oh, be. Exactly. I do <clears throat> just sort of want to wind down this in our first inaugural inaugural right. interview for the Art Gallery of Northumberland. Thank you, uh, Bob Omar. <laughs> but the last thing I want to just ask you about, and whether you you agree or disagree with this sentiment, is that you know over all these years of working, let's say forty, yeah, like, uh, uh, you have stayed true to your vision. Yeah, you haven't compromised yeah. very much. Um, people react to the work, they yeah. communicate. Um, the, uh, I, this is kind of an idea, I think places like the National Gallery of Canada or, or other institutions, the Art Gallery of Northumberland, or just people who are, like most of us, who are just interested in art, are really wanting to see your vision. Right. Um, you know, unfiltered, uncompromised. The, you know, which is the beauty of painting as opposed to music, because it's, music is more collaborative, I suppose the composer yeah. is, is the creator to begin with, but, but there is no reason, you don't need to veer off and, and try to create something that isn't true to yeah, your vision, right? Like, I you don't so many, need uh, to paint a landscape in no. the, the tradition of somebody else. And if I did paint a landscape, there'd be something I'm out of with it. <laughs> <laughs> like, there'd be something you skew in it. Well, there you go, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like we have a, I have a, had an idea. I got into those old Second World War underwater mines, you know, the, the balls, you know, the, and then I was looking at the back field and I said, wow, we, you know, I, I could have, I was going to do a painting called a Nine Acres Mind, and, you know, the mines would be on chains just floating out of the field, just in the air, right? So uh, that would be about as close to a landscape as I can, you know. Well, in the future, we look forward to having a landscape. Uh, uh, Exhibition, mm -hmm. a future exhibition mm -hmm. of maybe landscapes with mm -hmm. with animals in an unusual yeah. uh, situation. I'm sure you would, you would make it your own. So, <laughs> thanks for coming today. Thank well, you thank for you watching. Um, I hope you you enjoyed today's show, and uh, look forward to our next show, which will be Dorothy Caldwell, fabulous textile artist. Thank you so much. Thank you.